Uh, welcome everyone. Um, so this is um, the first grand rounds for this academic year. Um, and uh, the other special thing about um, today's grand rounds is that it is also somewhat a celebration of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is um, coming on its 30th anniversary, technically that is um, July 26th. So we're just a few days away. Um, and so the topic that um, Dr. Batrai has chosen is, is uh, extremely fitting in regards to disability advocacy. Um, Dr. Batrai is one of our own faculty. Um, she uh, studied um, psychology at the University of Kansas um, and uh, did her graduate work there and then uh, joined our uh, department as a uh, postdoctoral fellow and then became part of our faculty here at Johns Hopkins um, in the PM&R department and continues uh, her work, uh, which we'll hear a little bit more about. Um, again, the title of her talk today is Promoting okay, Health here, 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 at the here, Macro here. Level uh, Through Disability yeah, Advocacy. And I will um, hand the floor over to her to share with us what she has to say. Please mute, mute your- Please mute yourselves if you, um, if you're not speaking. Thank you so much. Jackie, you're mute. You, not you, you can't Jackie, hear you. Because you are the one who needs to be speaking. <laughs> oh, we should be hearing you. How about now? Can you hear me now? And you can see this uh, PowerPoint, right? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. No wonder I was asking for thumbs up from everyone. If they could hear and see me, no one was doing it. So, all right. So I'll put this in presenter mode um, and then we will begin. All right. Uh, so, hi everyone. I'm uh, excited to be here today to be able to talk to you about a very important topic. Um, so, as um, Tracy said, I'm an assistant professor in the Division for Rehabilitation Psychology and Neuropsychology here at Johns Hopkins. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about how we, as rehabilitation professionals, can promote equity at the population level using the foundational principles um, within my field of rehabilitation psychology, as well as the field of public health. Um, now, I, I realize it may seem like I'm focusing on rehabilitation psychology or public health, either both fields, but I think these uh, principles that we'll talk about today are incredibly uh, applicable across all rehabilitation disciplines, hence why I, um, we've selected to talk about them for this particular uh, piece of research. Um, so some disclosures to start. I, I think Pablo may have already said some of this, but um, I'm supported by the NIH, um, NIMHD, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, as well as the uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, uh, Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions. Now, this presentation actually um, could not have been possible without the work of also my um, co-authors uh, because this, so it was a, initially an oral symposium given at uh, Rehabilitation Psychology, our 2020 annual meeting, and um, then after, uh, briefly afterwards, it was published in what we consider our flagship journal in Rehabilitation Psychology. Here's a little um, image of it. I know people like to do this for presentations. I thought I would too. Um, this, uh, it was the joint work of my co-authors and also the School of Public Health as well as Seattle Pacific. Um, and as you can see, Dr. Steve Wagner is also um, a co-author who I know he's here today. Hey, Steve. All right, so let's let's talk about uh, the learning objectives for the presentation. Uh, first, we want, uh, well, they are to recognize health disparities between disabled and non-disabled persons, specifically in the US. 
describe the foundational principles in rehabilitation psychology and how they can be guides to promote macro or population level change across our rehabilitation disciplines. And finally, identify opportunities and examples that can guide us in our pursuit of health equity in our population. Now, there are two additional points I'd like to be very explicit about uh, before starting the presentation. Uh, like I said, this, I'll focus specifically on um, the disparities and potential ways to address them within the United States. And it's important to mention because I'm sure as we all know, um, our health system here in this country has, you know, unique challenges that other countries may not face and, you know, and benefits as well. So um, it's a whole different topic for a whole other grand rounds, but not for today. Um, and then the, the other one I, I want to mention is You'll notice my language use kind of varies throughout this presentation, uh, which is consistent with kind of the up-to-date recommendations in the literature on um, disability, also published in, in the same journal. Um, so Dunn and Andrews published this article called Say the Word, um, a disability culture commentary on the erasure, eraser of disability. Um, and this really calls for rehabilitation psychologists and other professionals to employ the evolving language um, that's appropriate given the current um, current culture or climate, and which involves the use of both person first language, which would be people with disabilities, um, and identity first language, which is disabled persons. Now among those in the room today, I'm sure you've heard both ways um, both terms be used. You may even have your own preference on what you uh, want to use. Um, and it was really helpful when this article came out because, um, you know, taking into consideration actual stakeholder input, um, the authors made the recommendation that we should be flexible depending on our context, um, taking in, you know, all points of views and things like that. So just as an FYI. And of course, I have just a couple acknowledgements I'd like to make. Uh, first, these are the people in the groups that um, made this research even possible. Of course, our division, uh, many uh, members who are here today, the MS Rehab Research Lab, uh, Drs. Byer and Hughes, who are also here today, I think, and um, then met some of my mentors in the School of Public Health in uh, the Center for Health Equity and Health Disparity Solutions, as well as the MS Center. And then, of course, I, I wanted to make sure we uh, recognize just the, the timeliness of this topic as well, because um, June 26th is going to be the 30th anniversary um, of the signing of the ADA into law. So. Um, just a brief overview, the ADA is part of the, the civil rights um, laws and the protections that are provided for um, individuals, for example, based on race, sex, national origin. It was with the ADA in 1990 that uh, gave these same protections to people with disabilities. It prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in all, really all areas of public life. Um, and it was a major advance and brought for significant improvements um, in the lives of disabled persons, especially with respect to like the physical, I think with the physical environment um, within public places. Um, and, and then I'll go, this is a great thing. And then I'll go on to some of the realities of what we see today is that like, despite these positive changes derived from the ADA, um, we know the disability con community continues to face inequalities and disparities in health and health care, um, community living participation, and many other areas. So just like, you know, um, passing this, the civil rights law for, you know, just based on race, we know that that didn't fully resolve everything, right? But it was a huge step. So just in, in that way, um, I think this, the ADA has had those benefits and we still have work to do. So let's talk about the um, overview of this presentation. 
So we'll start by going over um, some health disparities literature. Why, why is this even important? What, what does the literature say? I'll summarize that briefly. What are the contributing factors? Why do, they, why do these disparities exist? And then the last three sections of the presentation will switch from what problems are there to, okay, how can we maybe solve these problems? So we'll talk about um, the foundational principles of rehab psych, as well as the uh, approach taken by many of our public health professionals, including examples of interventions that have been implemented locally here in Baltimore and have seen um, great improvements in dis reduction in disparities, I should say. And then we'll end with um, emerging areas for us as rehabilitation professionals to actually promote equity in our own work and specifically in the disability community at the macro or the population level. So let's start with the um, summary of the existing health disparities literature in disability. So I want to I want to define what is what is a disparity? What is what is a disparities population? According to the US Department of Health and Human Services, there is a three specific criteria a group must meet to be able to be identified as such. So one, they have to um, be experiencing avoidable health inequities that are characterized two by differences in population health outcomes, yes, and three, that are related to social, economic, and environmental historical disadvantage. So based on these criteria, I certainly think the disability community would be considered a health disparities population. But let's, let's look a little further into this. So you might be thinking, well, why is it important that they be recognized as such? I mean, it, it's there. Why do we have to talk about this, these labels, right? So um, why is it important? Being recognized as a dis disparities population um, allows for more opportunities, such as like reallocating resources in the community or even like by the government, um, increasing funding opportunities as well as people then will start to include potentially more perspectives of uh, disabled persons in policy making because they, there's more national attention to it, I should say. So what, what does the data tell us? Do, you, do we think this group qualifies as a disparities population, quote unquote? So, Differences between disabled and non-disabled persons span multiple contexts, including healthcare access, insurance coverage, health behaviors, exposure to unhealthy environments, as well as violent victimization. So for example, working age adults with disabilities are over twice as likely than those without disabilities to delay or forego medical appointments due to concerns of costs regardless of health insurance coverage status. So think about this, it's, it's not, this isn't even the cost of health, um, getting health care. it's actually just the concerns of costs uh, because of the, the health system that we live and function in. People with disabilities are almost twice as likely to have unmet medical, dental, and prescription medication needs. Disabled people were found to have a greater risk for being a victim of non-fatal violent crime. So these were characterized as things like rape, sexual assault, robbery, and um, aggravated and simple assault. So in fact, between two, 2011 and 2015, this type of uh, victimization against disabled persons occurred at almost three times um, higher rate compared to non-disabled persons. So these, these disparities are very significant. They're there and they impact uh, people's quality of life. Now, what are the factors that we think have led to present day disparities? Because if you remember the definition by the Department of Health and Human Services talks about the factors that may have led to these in present day. So social and um, environmental elements of disablement, which are also known as the social determinants of health. That may be a term that you're 
um, hearing maybe more so um, in the media nowadays. But these determinants have led to major, major barriers for optimal quality of life and health for people with disabilities. However, when, when um, disabled persons have the same environmental resources and opportunities though, they no longer face these substantial barriers to participation and inclusion. Um, so this, this helps to reduce and sometimes like get rid of the existing disparities there. This really shows that disablement is not equivalent to impairment which is kind of what the traditional model of how the traditional model viewed uh, disability is impairment. So um, unfortunately, these traditional models, even though they overlook the social determinants of health, we've got now the um, World Health Organization's um, International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health Psychosocial Framework of Disability, which um, does indeed incorporate these social determinants, thank goodness. Um, and, uh, well, so I, I was going to say, we, uh, I don't know if we as a country are even in the World Health Organization, but those are my um, political thoughts coming into this, so we will keep moving along. Uh, the ICF involves uh, various facets of a person's disability or chronic condition. So, um, so some of you may know, I, my background is in multiple sclerosis, and um, I use the um, a person with MS the, as the disorder or disease to kind of uh, show this as an example of what the ICF um, applied looks like. So the health condition um, or disease can be impacted by um, and is characterized by various things, including body function and structure, activities, and participation. Now, if you notice, like the word impairment is kind of just like one piece of this model there, um, where you might have some impairment in your uh, function in gait, strength, memory, things like that, um, which also impact activities, and then your ability to participate. This can include things like just work, driving, work, um, being financially independent, and things like that. So, um, which are all related to, again, environmental factors, and then personal factors here at the beginning, or at the bottom. I wonder if I can. Um, and so, as we can see, it really it incorporates factors that were not incorporated in traditional models. For example, like these environmental factors that can impact people's access to care or how the environment is physically built, um, as well as personal factors that may come into play and not just a one-sided view. So, so as the ICF showed, you know, these present day disparities are the result of inequitable practices of society across all sectors of society. Um, so there's a big need for social justice and social justice is a word that's thrown around a lot and, and what does it actually, what does it mean? So researchers um, have defined it as um, meaning that everybody has a fair just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, um, and their consequences including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and healthcare. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of uh, background noise. Well, some, I'm not sure if someone's trying to get a hold of, okay. Just want to make sure no one's trying to uh, reach me because I can't see Zoom. But if you could mute your uh, mic, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, so during, throughout this presentation already, I've used two words, equality um, and equity. There are uh, differences in those terms that, uh, that are really important to highlight when we talk about promoting equity because when I say promoting equality versus promoting equity, they mean two different things. 
So this uh, figure, I think, really demonstrates that nicely. Equality means giving everyone the same thing, whereas equity means giving people what they need to reach their best health. So that doesn't necessarily always mean the same thing, right? It just means um, something that's like adapted to them to give them the best health opportunities. So for example, in this picture, let's say being able to ride a bike with your family is um, one way that people can achieve optimal health. Now, if, you, if we treat all four of these individuals the same as has been done in that top portion, You'll see everyone gets a bike, everyone gets the same size bike. However, only the woman in the middle would act, seems to be comfortable with riding this bike, um, at least if obviously. So to, to promote equity, we would give everyone a bike that's modified based on their needs so that everyone can still have that same potential to reach their best health. So with respect to the disability population, the long history of exclusionary practices and discrimination that people with disabilities experienced and continue to experience calls for us to promote equity. Now, achieving equality is certainly part of this process, but it can only go so far. So let's transition to the last uh, three uh, groups or areas which are going to talk about kind of, well, all of this is going on, what can we do, you know? And um, that's always something that we hear at presentations is, well, how can I maybe address this or help some, uh, contribute to this? So we'll start by talking about um, the foundational principles of rehabilitation psychology. Again, I think that, um, are very applicable to all of our rehabilitation disciplines. So here's a, um, a figure of like kind of like a summary of all the principles. And I wanted to use this figure because that they overlap um, in certain ways as well. Um, they're all kind of part of um, this bigger picture. So um, let's go. So I'll describe each one here. So the person environment interaction, it, this emphasizes the interaction between the person and their environment um, in disability related outcomes. So um, when confronted by disability, people tend to make attributions about the person rather than recognizing the role that envir the environment might play in shaping that person's opportunities. Um, Adjust, adjustment to disability is um, a really key piece of our fields. I think in rehabilitation, it signifies the process of coping with um, or adjusting to changes following the onset of disability. And this process is dependent on making constructive changes to that social and physical environment and not just the individual's process to adapt. Um, I know for me, at least, you know, in my clinical work, a lot of times I, um, I feel limited in that um, adjustment to disability and, and like one-on-one -on -one patient care focuses on what that person can do. And these huge, huge uh, environmental barriers are there. Um, and so we need to make sure we incorporate these factors into this process. Um, countering disability as defining or all-encompassing represents how the public um, and even newly disabled persons tend to judge people with disabilities by, by solely their disability, rather than viewing it as maybe one of the multiple aspects of their lives. Um, and psychosocial assets is the principle that people with disabilities uh, possess personal and psychological qualities that can actually help to support, develop, um, challenge, to address challenges associated with their disability. And you'll notice one of the um, public health examples I'll talk about actually really nicely highlights and uses this uh, principle um, to intervene. Self-perception of bodily states involves the experience of bodily states that we have, such as pain or fatigue. These experiences are really largely based on people's perception of the phenomenon, which are influenced by attitude, expectations, and then the environmental um, reinforcers. 
and um, best best for last, or I guess this, this the human dignity principle is, um, I think, a, a really crucial and like foundational one out of all of them, um, which signifies that regardless of the form of a disability, a person um, is a person, not an object, and deserves respect. No matter how severe the disability, um, that right is something that people with or without disabilities um, deserve. So, so these uh, foundational principles are, are, are big, right? They're, they're kind of like general, bigger terms or, uh, yeah, concepts. So when we think about them, a lot of people think about them as they're relevant, at least in like the field of rehabilitation psychology, as they're relevant to the clinical practice, day-to-day -day clinical practice with our patients. The example I even gave with um, adjustment to disability, I mean, I my first thought was with my patient, when we're talking about adjustment to disability, you know, I feel frustrated I can't address these bigger things. So, so what can we do about that frustration of not being able to address some of these other bigger things? I think these principles can very well apply beyond the clinical settings across um, our rehabilitation disciplines. They can be relevant um, in other fields like public health, policy making, um, and so I'll just kind of briefly go over some of these wonderful examples. Um, so the WHO ICF model can be a, a really huge guide for uh, future research efforts that want to incorporate um, the interaction between the person and the environment. Um, sure, we may have heard of participatory action research, PAR, um, using this kind of approach where we include, um, you know, relevant stakeholders all throughout the phases of research. Um, Next one, uh, human dignity. So this is um, advocating for practice and policy that promotes health equity for disabled persons. We'll talk about some specific examples of how we can really um, like solid techniques to really implement something like this. Um, and then psychosocial assets, kind of like I said, um, adopting and advocating for collaborative care models and practice and program implementation. Um, that really highlight people's assets. Um, all right, and then briefly, let's touch on the public health approach. Um, so in, in general, public health approach, looking at, um, looking at an issue or um, phenomenon or outbreak, uh, it involves four major steps surveillance, risk factor identification, intervention, and um, intervention evaluation, and then implementation. So surveillance looks at what's the problem, what, like, what's there. Risk factor identification asks for the cause. So we kind of talked about those two pieces in terms of like these disparities in disability have been studied and we know kind of a summary of the data that's there. We know some of the uh, contributors that cause these, um, but the, the last two are kind of kind of where we, as I think, rehabilitation professionals can make a big uh, impact and and work on. So, uh, looking at you know maybe existing interventions that uh, we already are familiar with, and then trying to apply it within in, in a larger scale, and how how does that work, and how do you implement it? Uh, to be more relevant for the bigger population. So just, um, I wanted to share two examples of how our colleagues in public health have actually um, pretty successfully implemented uh, some interventions. So I'm not sure if anyone's heard of the CAPABLE program, uh, but it was implemented right here like I said, in Baltimore on adults, older adults from lower income backgrounds. So they actually focused on all individuals except those from the wealthiest of uh, neighborhoods in Baltimore um, to provide a wide range of interventions 
um, that really target their specific home environments. So they did what, you know, that picture of health equity versus equality showed. They really modified and tailored those interventions to fit that person in their, within their home. Um, and the overall goal was to enhance their uh, participants' intrinsic control um, so their ability to maybe problem solve and reframe difficulties within their environments, um, and then reduce those extrinsic factors that really undermine their control. So like maybe if they live in a home with unsafe structures. Um, and let's see, so overall, their findings showed that um, just in general, an increase in activities of daily living and decreased depressive symptoms. And these uh, improvements were found across all demographic groups. This wasn't, um, you know, differential across groups, which is, which is really nice because, you know, the disparities literature shows us that, um, for example, with respect to racial disparities, uh, some of our interventions may not work as well with certain groups because they may not have been included in the original research studies that tested these interventions. And so what, what was nice was the, the adapting of interventions in the capable program, um, I think is, is a big part of what resulted in across the board consistent improvements. Um, and our foundational principles, um, I'm sure when I was describing the program, you could maybe think of what are some of the principles that could apply here? But um, very clearly the person environment relation um, it shows how much our environment and like the interaction between the two can impact current um, functioning and well-being, as well as adjusting to disability and people's psychosocial right. assets. Yes, yes, yeah, thanks. Um, and then, so the ADA park. So we, we talked about the ADA before, but this, this, you know, I think like if you want a model model example to refer to when you are about to start your macro level intervention immediately following this talk, the ADA park is actually an ideal, ideal one. Um, it was, let's see, so it used a participatory action research approach, um, which involves a shift in power from, um, the ones who traditionally hold power within the research uh, process. So maybe the researchers, the academics, and then gives this power to the people who are mostly affected by the issue of focus or um, who's, who are gonna be using the uh, interventions. So it takes that power and it equally distributes it across all relevant stakeholders. I apologize there, I do not have the sample written down. There was a sample, it's not um, a zero, so. Um, and so the overall goal of the ADA Park was to enhance um, participation across three dimensions. So uh, community living, community participation, as well as uh, work and economic participation. And I, I also feel like this is an example, a model example that you could refer to because I, I it, there is not one single foundational principle that this project did not include. Um, so we are aware of the time, so I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about some of the emerging um, opportunities that exist for rehabilitation professionals and then a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So with respect to opportunities, I'll kind of talk about these, these major areas um, and try to focus on maybe what, what seems um, most reasonable and feasible for us. Excuse me. So including stakeholder in engagement, which I've already mentioned multiple times, um, looking at assessment of disability, as well as big data. Those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, education, advocacy, and policy. <clears throat> so with respect to stakeholder engagement, Corey um, put out a quote saying, research is more likely to improve the care of patients 
if they and other key stakeholders are involved in all aspects of the research. Now this, this to me, you know, does not seem like any novel idea. However, it, you know, I think the involvement of stakeholders in and throughout the research project continues to be kind of a novel practice across certain fields. And I think we as rehabilitation professionals can really leverage this uh, specific practice. And uh, the, the movement, nothing about us without us, um, as it's applied you know, in the disability community is uh, so very important because the disparities that exist have come about from decades of making policies and large scale decisions that will impact people with disabilities, but none of them were made taking into consideration the perspectives, experiences of people with disabilities. And so this statement is uh, really rings true here, nothing about us without us. Um, and it can be applicable for uh, research models like, the, like PAR, um, community-based participatory action research and collaborative care models. Um, I included some example studies, um, actually, uh, so Steve Wagner here, he's um, as well cited here, but the um, PAL study as well as the MS CARE trial are just a couple of examples in um, our field that have used these research models. Another, um, another way that we can also make a difference for those of you who might like, you know, to really look at the data, you love the data, the community stuff's great, but it's not as exciting as digging into big data. So, you know, there's um, great opportunities for people who prefer this as well. So there's, um, I've listed up there uh, a handful of different data sets that are open access available um, and have rehabilitation data that we can use um, to promote equity. So, and how, how can we use this big data to promote health equity? It doesn't, it doesn't seem like the impact that you would have going out in the community might make. However, we know that from the disparities literature to address and successfully address these disparities that exist, the first step of the overarching three steps is to identify that disparities exist. We have to detect and we have to show that they exist. This is how we can get governmental funding or um, a greater say in policy making, things like that. And big data can play a huge role in allowing for us to highlight, okay, these disparities do exist. Um, and the next step in addressing disparities is to um, identify the underlying sources or causes. And so these data can also help to identify potential contributors, um, which then become the focus of step three, which is to intervene on um, these factors and try to reduce disparities. So um, yes, we'll move to the next slide. And um, I can share these slides so that you have some of these resources and content afterwards. Another um, important area and uh, way in which um, we can promote equity in the larger uh, disability community is by really tailoring our education and training experiences. Um, we all, you know, we've all heard the importance of recruiting underrepresented populations to, um, to the training programs because it's very important um, from the disparities literature that patients um, can also relate to some of their providers, that some of their providers even just look like them. We know that that can make a difference. And so not only for that reason though, but um, also because having a diverse group of providers, clinicians can bring diverse um, viewpoints, problem solving techniques that may not have been thought about before. Um, and in this case, an example of a training activity that you know I think our um, division department could engage in is including people uh, with disabilities as the educators, um, whether that be you know 
for a class for like a training rotation, whatever, um, wow. whatever fits logistically, but including them as the educators to show, you know, the experiences and to be able to learn about difficulties, successes, things like that. I do want to mention though, when I say include or um, include people with disabilities as the educators, I don't mean to say that um, rehabilitation professionals and people with disabilities are two distinct categories. Oftentimes there's, there's an overlap. So I, I just wanted to um, put that out there. So even capitalizing on some of the resources that we might already have within our own um, disciplines. And now um, this this piece is um, a policy advocacy piece. So it's evidence informed policy making. So another way that we can promote health equity is um, using the HIAP framework. Um, so it, it, it stands for health in all policies. It will do interdisciplinary it. collaborations, specifically because yeah. the inequitable disparities that we see now are the result of do decisions you? made across multiple sectors of society. And so um, these principles are consistent also with the foundational principles um, of social justice and human rights. Um, the framework emphasizes the the consequences and accountability of public policies on health determinants, and it aims to promote accountability of even these policymakers for health impacts at all levels of policy making. hype over rising numbers if it doesn't translate to increased mortality. So here's a uh, figure of what this what the HIAP kind of looks like. It, it's it's a big big concept, but. Um, it, it truly is the ideal way to promote equity at the population level. When applied in real life, it can look different across settings depending on what it's focusing on, but the major themes across all health and all policies programs involve, one, exposing how policies and large-scale decisions made in sectors outside of healthcare can impact health. So this can include things like the financial industry, housing, transportation, among many others. For example, what decisions were made about transportation, public transportation available in a certain neighborhood nearby our hospital, and how did that impact your patients? What can we do about that? Um, we know that access to health care and transportation go hand in hand lots of times. Perhaps the most relevant in, you know, in the U.S. and in this individualistic society that we live in, this uh, HIAP framework also shows how people's improved health can advance the goals of all these different sectors, even if they are outside of the health healthcare space. Sure so this this really helps to get the buy-in that we need from different groups, right? So you have this model of I'll scratch you scratch my back, I scratch yours, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, you, when you approach it in that way, you have businesses are more likely to buy in. Um, it can also be thought of there in, in our context, it can be thought of similarly to an inpatient unit. Okay. Uh, with a rehabilitation team that works together to serve the needs of the patient. So interdisciplinary collaboration where like each professional brings in their own expertise. Um, we know that that is hugely beneficial for the patient, patient care. So just like that, different sectors of society, even outside of healthcare, can work together to improve health um, and promote equity. Um, and a, a resource specifically for the United States, you know, within our health system, is an article by, um, let me see. In the public, in, in the Journal of Public Health and Management, this is, I'll, I'll send this around in the slides, but again, like I said, the US has unique um, healthcare, health space dynamics. And so they really um, tried to adapt the HIAP, which is an internationally known framework that would fit within our specific um, healthcare space in the United States. Um, 
And these include things like enhancing workforce capacity, developing and structuring cross-sector relationships, incorporating health, incorporating health into decision-making processes across sectors and more. Now, unfortunately, I'm aware of the time and um, I wanted to leave some time for questions and comments. Um, but again, here are just some examples of the ways that we can implement those actions. So I just, I wanted to quickly summarize um, the key takeaways. This is kind of, I covered a wide range of things and um, I just wanna go over key, these six key points. So we know that um, significant health disparities between disabled and non-disabled persons exist. The influences of these inequities, which include social determinants of health are largely preventable which uh, calls for social justice efforts. The our field, the rehabilitation um, foundational principles are grounded in social justice and thus then lend themselves as really excellent tools to leverage um, in order to broaden our focus, maybe from the individual patient level to more of the population level. But this will involve us to collaborate with professionals in the field of public health to be able to reach wider groups that we may not have reached so far or at this point. And there are numerous emerging opportunities for us to engage in population level work. Um, a central, central theme of this work, however, should include stakeholder engagement, um, regardless of what the focus might be, you know, remembering that nothing about us, nothing about us Nothing about us without us, yes. Um, movement, it's so critical to remember, regardless of the effort you're engaged in. Um, and then other opportunities, including the use of big data, um, adapting existing training practices, um, as well as policy and practice. And then, you know, just for fun, I, I put a QR code of my contact info. If you have questions, I can send out uh, some of the resources I sadly didn't get to talk about today as much as I wanted. Um, and that is all. So I will close out of this. Hey, Jackie, I have a question. Uh-huh. Hi, um, my name is Mackenzie Worthington. I'm a physical therapist and I've worked at a couple different locations um, within the Hopkins network at this point. I'm currently downtown at Meyer. Um, I think, A, like I love this presentation because I, I think getting that engagement and connecting with people on a very personal level is something that I do every single day with every single patient. So I really enjoy this presentation. Um, and sometimes when it comes down to issues of because it's happened for the three years that I've been here, transportation issues, you know, they have, you know, and then it's someone who has a disability and they have a burn all over their hand and they say that their guardian hasn't even been at home for a week. Do you, and it takes a certain level of, you know, work during lunch, out during their session or after work to kind of go, what do I need to do here? What, what are their transportation needs? What's available? So I kind of have to get to know the system and understand that system um, to find out what they're, what I can do about it. Do you have, are you, uh, part of what you didn't get to, would that potentially include improving like provider awareness of what access to resources we can then um, be aware of and then provide for our patients? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. That's such an important point. Um, but what I have in these slides, I wouldn't say like have specific um, tools that you can use like in that particular situation you're saying. However, I think on a larger scale, yes, I think like, you know, implementing a program that maybe uh, disseminates knowledge among providers themselves who work with these patients um, and assessing you know how helpful that they think that may have been and modifying that uh, as needed or even like asking patients you know what do you think that we can equip our providers with 
um, you know, outside of just basic like health um, and medical topics that you might tradi you know, traditionally discuss um, that would be most beneficial. So there's multiple ways to go about it, but that, that's just an excellent example of how um, you can promote equity right through training um, and including patients in, in their perspectives in that way. Very cool, thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> Other questions maybe from the, the group? Someone's asking in the chat. Um, is this getting more known? And are there any actions made to promote knowledge? Ah, about that. Yes, yeah. So the the question. I don't know if any everyone's read it in the chat. Ableism is a discrimination of and social prejudice against people with disabilities, based on the belief that typical abilities are superior. Um, do you think ableism is a term that is getting more known to the public? And are there any actions made to promote knowledge about this to the public, except for the HIAP framework? So I, you know, this makes me think right away about like our education and training programs. Um, no matter how much, uh, you know, an educator or trainer might have knowledge and background on disability research and studies, I think again, like, uh, pulling in a stakeholder or someone with a disability um, can can help to train like the future generation uh, because ableism it's 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 really ingrained in many parts of our society um, so training is one way I can see that as um, being applied um, right now off the top of my head I can't think of other things but Jackie, is asking, uh -huh. is it, can I make a comment? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, why, when I hear Jackie's presentation, and I've heard this a couple times now, a um, couple things that I take away from this. First of all, most of us, when we think of health disparities, we tend to think of health disparities based on race or ethnicity. And we need to under think about, as, we're, as our country is very attuned to disparities, we need to be people begin to think about people with disability as an unrepresented minority whose voice needs to be heard more and we need to think about them when reducing disparities. Because as Jackie pointed out in her slides, the health disparities are significant for people with disability in terms of access to care and outcome. So we should be, as our department should be advocating for that. The second point I would make is a lot of what Jackie said is relevant and many of us think about this because most of us are clinicians and we see patients. As a, lot of the, a lot of these terms and concepts are relevant to our clinical care, but we also are called, as Jackie is calling us to do, is to think about more on a societal level and to think about how we can get our field of physical medicine rehabilitation more engaged in policy research and policy activism. Because while most of us, like I say, are clinicians and very focused on the individual, that of course is an important calling, but there is opportunity for our field to get more involved at the policy level. So I, I appreciate Jackie, your, your presentation today. Thank you, Steve. And Steve has had a lot to do with the making of this work and presentation. So uh, thank, I, I thank him as well. One thing I, I, I do wanna say is like, I've had, so the two questions I've had is, you know, it just, it, um, it makes me just think about the importance of um, interdisciplinary collaboration and like building these uh, relationships within the environment. I think it was McKinsey, you said like, I have to get to know my own and I have to know my own environment and how to navigate these things. And uh, because then maybe I have a tool I could share with the patient about gaining transportation access, you know? And so th that, that involves like, really a lot of time, commitment, and effort invested um, in developing these relationships so that then, oh, well, let me contact this person here who may have some resources. And um, I, I, it's so much easier said than done. I, I realize that, but um, I, I think that's where the HIAP model also really comes in. It, uh, these are things that 
I should say clinical work, I think is the primary means by which people, even in like public health, have come up with many of their ideas that they've had because in their one-on-one um, -on -one individual work, they notice these patterns happening over and over again. And so then they uh, look into, well, how can I um, do something about this like on a larger scale? Because I'm so frustrated with, you know, all my patients having to deal with this. Um, and so it, it involves being creative and seeking out those connections and relationships that you traditionally would not have. Jackie, I, this is Bill Stiers. I have a question for you and perhaps for Dr. Selnick as well. Um, <clears throat> I know that public health people tend to think in terms of huge numbers and, mm -hmm. and health, but I wonder if as a department, we shouldn't figure out how to apply the principles that you've discussed today in our own work with our patients and with our local community. And if we shouldn't try to develop an action plan to address, to implement some of the principles you're talking about and address some of the inequalities within our own backyard. Yeah, yeah. Bill, are you, are you offering to maybe head up to some type of effort like that? I am not. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I mean, that's that's why I wanted to apply this talk within our specific rehabilitation field in that um, I think just the, the joining of like public health in our field, there's so much, so much benefit to be had. Pablo? Uh, absolutely. I think you I, I was going to say, I don't know that we can fix the world, but perhaps we can fix our <laughs> of it. Well, I think that... Uh, Sure. So, so thank you, Jackie, for the great talk. And, and um, again, much appreciated. And, and I appreciate also the comment that uh, Bill is saying uh, about how we can start thinking how to apply some of these principles in our own uh, daily activities and so on. I also appreciate, Jackie, how you asked Bill if he's most volunteer on this. <laughs> it wasn't me who was asking, it was you. But, um, so I, I agree. And I think that it would be, I mean, this is, this is the beginning, perhaps, you know, as having these conversations is important. I'm becoming aware of these issues. Uh, it's the first start. And then, you know, one thing that we have discussed is to create some form of workforce or committee or group that is going to be uh, um, trying to tackle issues of disparity and, and engagement. And, uh, you know, again, it, it doesn't need to be limited to only racial or ethnicity issues. So um, as we are thinking in a broad sense, uh, I think that it may make sense to, to, to think how we can incorporate some of these principles into the activities that we want to do and so on. Yeah, I agree. I like what you said about expanding it from the focus, you know, a lot of times disparities work focuses on race, right? But expanding that well, because race and disability are two um, areas that are oftentimes overlapping too, so. Other comments or questions from the from the group? Just have an up. Was someone saying something? Adam Adam's iPhone. Hi, Jackie. Thank you so much for a great Hi. talk. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So I just um, I'm Adam, one of the new PGY twos uh, mm -hmm. residents. Uh, I just have an observation. I just recently learned that. One of the criteria for inpatient admissions uh, uh, for a patient uh, to be in the inpatient rehab is um, to have um, a safe dispo and a safe discharge place, which excludes a, a major disadvantaged patient population, which is the homeless. And I was wondering if there is any efforts, public health-wise, to you know combat that part. Oh, that, that's a really good question. Off the top of my head, I, I do not know off the top of my head, but I do know that there's been multiple like larger scale efforts targeting um, the homeless population because like inpatient um, admission is not the only thing that they might be excluded from, you know, due to the homeless status. And so um, I I am sure I could find a resource or two that has, has that. That's a really excellent point. Um, 
homeless homeless populations and then also incarcerated populations. I, I think um, there's been lots of work in that, given that they are excluded, right, from um, many, many of these supports that our society provides. Ah, Abby sent. Adam, I don't know if you saw the chat, but um, Dr. Hughes sent um, a website with some resources that are relevant to your question. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is nice. Other questions or, or comments? Uh, Tracy is sharing now in the chat uh, the call to claim CMEs uh, for the participation. So uh, I think if there are other uh, comments, of course, uh, Jack is a member of the faculty and uh, you all know how to reach her and so on. And if you all feel so kind of mobilized, like uh, as Peter was suggesting or, or, or Adam was asking, I think that uh, it would be good to hear and, and look into your local environments to, to, to find opportunities to perhaps expand these activities. Uh, certainly from the department perspective, when I try to create these things, but this doesn't need to be a top-down thing. This is actually more of a bottom-up uh, as you're going through your daily life to look into the mm -hmm. tune of these issues and, and see how to incorporate some of these principles. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, Tracy, is that, uh, I think this, uh, Jackie was the menu for today. <laughs> that is everything. Thank you so much for a <laughs> wonderful talk and uh, we will see everybody next month. Great. Thank, Thank you, you everyone you for your time. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Great work. We all are clapping from here in our individual rooms. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, fantastic work. Bye bye everyone.